It's on. Thank you for coming today to Grand Rounds. We have two speakers, which will uh, be a very diverse but I think exciting session. Our first speaker is um, Saj Khan, who will tell us about an interesting problem regarding whether or not to operate on patients with operate on the metastatic lesions of patients based on molecular profiling. So Saj, Saj, Saj has been here for about a year, having just arrived from Sloan Kettering. Okay, thanks, Dan. Thanks for the invitation to present. I have no disclosures. Over 1.6 million Americans were diagnosed with cancer last year, and over half a million people died of cancer. And it's not just a national problem, it's a local problem as well. Most of these cancer-related deaths are attributable to metastasis, and that's going to be the focus of this talk. This slide is no surprise, but um, it takes three solid tumors that people in the audience, I'm sure, are used to dealing with. And it just pretty much shows that once you have distant disease, the outcomes are not as good as if you have localized disease. And we see that this in the breast cancer literature, the colon cancer, and uh, the melanoma. So I'm a surgical oncologist. And um, so uh, for us, metastasis is not always uh, the type of, uh, type of individuals that we take care of. But there are some roles for surgical oncologists in patients with metastatic disease. So most of our current therapies for metastasis are actually palliative, and the traditional treatment has been systemic, chemo systemic therapies or hormonal manipulation. But this rarely eradicates all the gross disease for most solid tumors, and some tumors that were responsive will progress, and we see this with the BRAF inhibitors and uh, the use of melanoma. But when you look carefully at some of the surgical literature and, the, and more recently the radiation oncology literature, that you, you do see that there is survival benefits for some individuals with limited uh, metastatic disease burden. And, um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. So th if we look at the thoracic oncology literature, uh, these are five large studies uh, of, of retrospective uh, nature where patients that underwent pulmonary resections for various types of primary uh, histologic tumors underwent a resection. And you see you can have uh, five-year survivals as good as 45% in individuals with renal cell carcinoma, but you see various types of histologic tumors um, are amenable to metastasectomies. When surgeons decide whether or not someone needs a metastasectomy, what we focus on primarily are clinical variables. And this is the largest study that I know of, of patients that want pulmonary resections uh, for metastatic lung disease. And you see that if you have um, a single met or a lung disease-free survival, those are considered favorable clinical variables, and, their, and individual outcomes are better than if you have more adverse clinical variables. But one, the point of this slide is just to talk about that, to mention that um, clinical variables is what is primarily looked at uh, to decide if someone needs a clinical uh, a metastasectomy. Not only do we see this in the thoracic oncology literature, we see this in the um, hepatic uh, oncology literature as well, too. And these are six large studies uh, of patients with colorectal cancer liver metastases. Um, and uh, the largest one, and the number of 58% is seen by the study by Pollock et al. in 2005. So if patients are carefully selected, you can have good survivals for patients with colorectal cancer liver metastases. This is a classic paper in the surgical oncology literature. This, is, uh, this came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering in 1999. And these are some of the variables that are looked at, um, the clinical variables that are looked at to decide if someone needs a surgical resection or will not. And essentially, there is a Fong score developed by the senior author here, Yuman Fong. And the more of these variables you have, the higher score you have, and the higher chance you have for recurrence within five years. But. The, the point of this slide here is to show that even though we resect individuals with metastatic cancer, and this is actually specifically colorectal cancer liver metastases, a high proportion of those patients will recur. Over 50% of patients that under, undergo a liver resection for colorectal cancer liver metastases will undergo an intrahepatic recurrence, and 60% that undergo will undergo an extrahepatic recurrence as well, too. So patients recur. So this lends to the question. Can we improve patient selection for resections? And are we actually ex excluding some individuals for resections by just focusing on the clinical variables and not looking at uh, other things, uh, which we'll get into? So uh, an overview of today's talk is I'm going to give some surgical oncology case examples of patients I've seen in the clinic in the last year. We'll talk about what oligometastatic disease is, what are microRNAs, and how do they relate to oligometastasis, 
and uh, will incorporating molecular markers to clinical variables may, uh, will that better de determine who to take to surgery? And that way we could get closer to answering the question of whether or not we should resect or not. So this is a patient I saw within the last year. Uh, it was a 60, it's a 64-year-old male with metastatic colon cancer. And uh, this PET scan shows he has two liver mets, but he also had a little bit more disease burden too. He had portal lymphadenopathy. So the decision was made by looking at the clinical variables to start initiate with systemic chemotherapy. And unfortunately, the patient had bad biology, and this is what happened in, uh, on systemic chemotherapy. He actually had progression of his liver disease, and he also developed uh, brain metastases. This is a second patient. Uh, this is a 60-year-old female um, who was treated with chemotherapy for three years, um, and uh, she had colorectal cancer liver metastases. Her primary tumor was in place, and you see the liver met there and the lung met there. And we looked at the clinical variables, and after looking at all the clinical clinical variables, we decided that this was be an excellent patient for to be aggressive with surgery. And so we performed a staged operation uh, with a pulmonary wedge resection, uh, followed by a synchronous hepatectomy and colectomy. And the patient's done quite well, and the operation was not that long ago, but she's been disease-free. So why do we see these favorable survivals in some patients with metastases? So it has to do with this concept here called oligometastasis. So oligometastasis is a term that was coined by Sam Hellman and Ralph Luxbaum in 1995. I actually had the pleasure of being in their lab. Uh, so a lot of the data I'll present is work that we, I did in their lab. Uh, but it is metastases that are limited in number and organ site. It's an intermediate, intermediate state of metastasis, and it's, uh, it's before malignant cells require, acquire the potential to become widely metastatic. And the clinical implication of this is obvious, and we see this in our patients, it's, is that you can perform potentially curative treatments for localized forms of cancer. Basically, there are two different types of oligometastasis. There's a true oligometastasis, which are patients that present with a synchronous lesion, like the patient I presented before with the colon cancer in place and a, prime and a metastatic lesion in place, or metachronous presentations where a metastatic lesion uh, presents in uh, the form of recurrence. And there's also this concept of induced oligometastasis, and we see this a lot with the use of imatinib uh, in patients with gastrointestinal stromal tumors uh, with that receive neoadjuvant therapy. There have actually been very few studies distinguishing the biology of oligometastatic from polymetastatic disease, and uh, it's uh, my belief that understanding the biology uh, of this entity called oligometastasis will improve patient selection for local therapies. So the purpose of this slide is just to reinforce the point that metastasis is not a simple process. It's a complex process. Many genetic changes are required by a tumor in order to become, to form a metastatic lung colony. So microRNAs, so we'll just take a sidestep and talk a little bit about microRNAs in the context of metastasis. So microRNAs, I'm sure there's experts in the audience on this, um, they are important important things. So they're important for normal, cell, for normal cellular physiology, but they're also very important in cancer cell biology. Um, and this is a figure from Victor Ambrose, who actually is one of the discoverers of microRNAs. It's an older paper, but it's a good one from uh, 2004 by Victor Ambrose. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of what ma microRNAs are, but uh, they have been shown to be important in metastasis specifically. They've been shown to be metastasis promoters. We see this in, we've seen this in breast cancer and other types of solid tumors as well, too. They've also been shown to be metastasis suppressors as well, too. However, despite all that, microRNAs have never been examined in the context of oligometastasis until the two studies I'm about to show. So first question we asked in this first study I'll present is, do microRNAs identify patients with oligometastatic disease? So this was uh, uh, the first of uh, two studies that I'm, I'm going to present, like I mentioned. Um, so this, these are patients that actually had a primary tumor that was treated successfully um, and had limited metastatic burden, one to five metastatic disease, uh, lesions in patients that were deemed inoperable by the surgeon. And they, under, they had a good performance status, and they underwent stereotactic RT. And then patients were assessed radiographically and clinically, and those that did not have disease progression were deemed the oligometastatic group, and those that d were deemed to have progressive disease were we deemed into the, we categorized into the polymetastatic group. Uh, I'm going to present a limited amount of data here just in the interest of time, but we looked at 34 patients, but the focus of what I'll present are the, are the 14 metastatic tumors that we looked at. One key point is 
there are various primary histologies, as you can see here, from sarcoma uh, to colorectal or head and neck tumors. And the metastatic tissue deposits were not just one metastatic tissue deposit. It encompassed various organs from adrenal glands, the, breast, uh, the brain, uh, small bowel, and those that are listed here. So uh, RNA was extracted. We used, uh, we worked very closely with the bio, with the statistician um, uh, in these both of these studies, and we performed a human microRNA array uh, and unsupervised hierarchical clustering. Were used to assess the metastatic tumors, the primary tumors, and we actually had five paired tumors as well too. And then these were val uh, validated uh, to develop a prioritized list of microRNAs. So this is the first key bit of data. So this heat map shows. In the, the rows represent microRNAs, and the columns represent individual patients of the study. What this shows is that using microRNAs, you can cluster patients into an oligometastatic group and a polymetastatic group. And we see that for eight of 10 patients that had oligometastatic disease, and six of six patients that had polymetastatic disease. So that's the key point of this slide. What's also important is this clustering is not based on various tumor histologies. It's actually based on oligo versus polymetastatic phenotype. One last point I'll mention on this is um, uh, we also had five pair of tumors. I don't, I don't show this data. Um, but individuals that had a primary tumor paired with their metastatic tumor were uh, also looked at, and there showed to be a correlation or a clustering between those patients as well, too, which lends to some other questions we can discuss. Uh, subsequently, we developed an individual, uh, individual list of uh, microRNAs, and these are, this is the list that we came out with uh, looking at polymetastatic versus oligometastatic uh, patients. Uh, and what we found is there was a microRNA called 200C, which is a very important microRNA in cancer, um, and it was increased 20-fold in the polymetastatic group compared to the oligometastatic group. At the same time, we had been perfecting or optimizing a mouse model, a syngenaic mouse model, I should mention, um, and what we did is we transfected this microRNA into uh, a low metastatic burden cell line, the B16F1 cell line, and performed tail vein injections and sacrificed the mice um, at subsequent time points. And the results that we found correlated and supported the clinical data. It showed that individuals that had microRNA 200C transfected into a low metastatic burden cell line had a significantly increased number of metastases than those individuals, than those uh, uh, cell lines that did not have the microRNA transfected. And this trend held true at three weeks out too, and you see that, and you see the same trend of data there as well. So why does this happen? So this is actually act, an active area of research right now going on in Ralph Luxebaum and Sam Hellman's lab. Uh, but this, is, this simplified cartoon tries to explain that. So for a primary tumor, uh, primary tumors, uh, solid tumors try to maintain an epithelial phenotype. So if you have an epithelial phenotype, microRNA 200, 200 family is up. However, in order for a, a, a to primary tumor to intravasate and get into this uh, bloodstream, it has to acquire a mesenchymal phenotype. So when it's, looked, when it's been looked at in other, with other investigators, microRNA 200 is down. But in order to, uh, the tumor needs to set up shop at a distant site. In order to set up shop at a distant site, you need to, the tumor needs to regain its epithelial phenotype and a few other investigators have supported our findings as well too, and they found that microRNA 200 family is up um, in their metastatic tumor sites as well too, regaining the epithelial phenotype. So how does this correlate with our, how does this go along with our study? So we believe that there's a process called epithelial mesenchymal transition or ME EMT, and a reverse process called MET, which is regaining of the epithelial phenotype. So uh, in support to our data, we saw that in the primary tumor data set, microRNA 200C was not overexpressed. I did not show that, but uh, microRNA 200 was not overexpressed in the primary tumors. However, in the metastatic tumors, like I showed, microRNA 200C is overexpressed in the polymetastatic uh, data set. And not only was it overexpressed in the uh, polymetastatic compared to the oligometastatic data set, um, but also it's supported with this, was also supported in our mouse model where transfection of 200C increased the number of metastatic lung colonies in mice. So in summary, microRNAs do play an important role in metastasis biology. Overexpression of microRNA 200C in patients with 
metastasis is associated with a polymetastatic phenotype. Transfection of 200C into a low metastatic cell line changes the phenotype to one of high metastasis. And the data does suggest that mere 200C enhances metastatic lung colonization. So then the second study, so based on that pretty exciting study, we decided to forge ahead and look at patients that actually had pulmonary resections. So the question for this second uh, set of data that I'll present is, do microRNAs char characterize oligometastasis in patients undergoing a pulmonary lung resection, uh, wedge resections for the most part? So we looked at 63 patients when it was all said and done um, uh, in a retrospective nature uh, that had tumor available for uh, resections for various sorts of primary tumors, one to five metastatic lesions, a good amount of follow-up data. And this time, um, our statisticians uh, worked very hard, and, they, and we came up with this metastatic recurrence, uh, so a rate of uh, metastatic uh, recurrence. So we divided those individuals into those with a low metastatic rate of recurrence and those with a high metastatic rate of recurrence, and we deem these as the oligometastatic and the polymetastatic groups. And what you see here is that in blue, you see those individuals that are part of the low metastatic recurrent or the oligometastatic group, and they have very good clinical outcomes. You actually see on the top that some patients actually never recurred at all with our median amount of 16-month follow-up, and then you see in the red, uh, individuals that recurred quickly with metastatic disease, um, and then we uh, we did not look at, and we excluded individuals in the intermediate group. And the first thing you see is that the median overall survival is drastically different between the two groups. In our oligometastatic group, the median overall survival was 63 months, and those with the polymetastatic group, that survival was 18 months. Similar kind of uh, statistics were used, unsupervised hierarch hierarchical clustering of microRNAs, again, distinguished oligo from polymetastatic disease. And you see that oligometastatic patients using microRNAs were clustered 62% of the time, and those with polymetastasis using microRNAs were clustered uh, over 80% of the time. When we developed a prioritized list of individual microRNAs and compared the oligometastatic to with the polymetastatic group, what you see is a big list of microRNAs. But you see what, what's interesting is most of them were overexpressed uh, in the oligometastatic compared to the polymetastatic group. So why is that important? The reason it's important is because a little less than half of those actually have tumor suppressive functions, strongly suggesting that overexpression of tumor suppressive associated microRNAs can potentiate the oligometastatic phenotype. So in summary, the rate of metastasis recurrence correlates with survival. MicroRNAs distinguish oligometastasis from polymetastasis. MicroRNAs in lung oligometastasis are enriched for tumor suppressive function. So let's put this all together. So going back to our second patient that you know has that had the good outcome. Um, so you know the patient had a liver med, had a lung med, um, and we looked at clinical variables uh, to decide what the right thing to do is for this patient. And we, the patient's been disease-free um, for a short period of time. But wouldn't it be better is it, if we can incorporate molecular markers in addition to the clinical markers to decide who should get undergo metastasectomy so we can achieve long-term disease-free survival? Um, one of the earl earlier slides I showed you is despite us doing liver, a surgical oncologists doing liver sections for patients with colorectal cancer or liver mats, many of those patients will recur anyway. So, um, so I think we need to do improve upon how we select those patients. So metastasis is a leading cause of cancer-related deaths. Oligometastasis is a potentially curative distinct clinical entity along a wide spectrum of metastasis. MicroRNA expression does characterize oligometastasis, and surgical resection can improve clinical outcome in patients with oligometastatic disease. Some patients that we select to resect or cut recur, and that's despite favorable clinical characteristics. But there are also some patients I'm sure of that we're not selecting for resection that we should uh, because we're so focused on looking at clinical variables. And if we had a way to select those patients, such as microRNAs, and the answer is not just going to be in microRNAs. It's going to be, it's going to be a complicated answer, but microRNAs are probably part of the answer. So in conclusion, incorporating molecular markers or microRNAs into patient selection for oligometastatic res uh, resection will improve patient outcome. So uh, 
I've only been here for a year, but this is a study I'm trying to uh, get off the ground here. Um, between my time at Sloan Kettering and the University of Chicago, uh, with a large program project grant, we have uh, look. We're starting to examine patients that have had over 50 uh, that have had colorectal cancer, liver metastases, and use the same kind of logic to look at microRNAs as well too. And we actually have mRNA data too. So this is a project that we plan to undergo uh, to get going. And the long-term goal is to examine molecular markers in metastatic tissue to distinguish oligo from polymetastatic disease, and hopefully, you know, to develop predictive biomarkers or signatures uh, for oligometastasis and polymetastasis. You need larger sample sizes in order to get to that point. So we haven't had large sample sizes yet, but that's ultimately the goal. So of course, this work is uh, supported by, was done by many people that are all listed on this slide here. Um, but I'd like to especially thank Sam Hellman, Ralph Luxbaum, Mitch Posner, and Pat Patey for, uh, for allowing me to be involved in this project.